Hi, today I want to talk about rebalding very shortly. This video is going to get me into a lot of trouble with the people in this business that do what I do for a living because they don't want to hear this. A lot of them know it's true but don't really want to believe it or they do actually believe enough in their own bullshit that they believe that what I'm saying is false. But this is something that you as a customer and even more importantly if you do this as a business that you as a business need to hear before you dig yourself into a miserable miserable hole and ruin your your reputation and that is that reballing is bullshit reballing is crap reballing is not repair 99% of the time I mean 99% of the time reballing is not repair and there are legitimate uses for reballing that I'm going to explain later on in the video but to get my point across right now in the beginning of this video 99% of the time when you hear that somebody is going to fix a laptop by reballing something, they are full of shit, and this is not going to work properly. So let's take the 2011 unibody MacBook Pro, for example. This machine is starting to die. As most defective Apple machines do, they are programmed with a little timer inside of them to fail as the user's Apple Care is running out. And Apple Care is starting to run out on most of these at the moment, which is why we're seeing so many of them, because the little timer inside that says to die right after the three years of Apple Care is up is finally going off. And it's kind of like those 2008 machines and 2007 machines that they had where all the graphics chips were dying like crazy. It's like 2008 and 7 all over again with the shitty Nvidia chips. And a lot of people are asking what the problem is. What is the cause of the problem? And I'd like to spell it out in this video. It's actually a couple of things. The first thing, above all, are shitty chips. These chips suck. These chips that are coming out by ATI these chips that ATI put out are just as bad as the shit that NVIDIA was putting out in 2008. Maybe like one step better, but not really. Secondly, as you know, most Apple machines, in spite of them being marketed to people who do graphics for a living, in spite of them being marketed to people who use their computer seriously for a living, they have no ventilation holes on the bottom of it. So while even a $300 piece of garbage PC has all these little vent holes on the bottom so it gets air, MacBooks have shit. They have this little exhaust in the back. That's just a complete fucking joke. They don't have any real ve they don't have real ventilation, which is why they run so damn hot. And the third problem is the thermal paste. Uh, anybody who takes apart Apple machines on a regular basis is familiar with that like gray, gooky, gunky garbage that they call thermal paste. Again, you're paying two thousand dollars for the machine. Can you use something that doesn't work like shit? I mean, when you clean that stuff and replace it with something good, you'll see 3, 6, sometimes 12 or 15, 15 Celsius drop in temperature when you replace that garbage with something like Tunic T uh, TX4. But again, why well, spend the extra money on the $2,000 machine? Whatever. Apple needs to make money. Anyway, regardless of what the actual issue is causing them to die, we have that issue now. You have a machine that's dead, and now you need to fix it. So how are you going to fix it? You're going to see a lot of different options online. You're going to see a lot of different options all across the world for things that you can do to fix it. And I'm here to tell you that most of these options suck. A lot of them involve something called reballing. You've probably heard of reballing, reflowing, and you don't really know what these things mean because you're just somebody who wants to go back to editing videos so they can make money. So I'm going to try to sum it up and make it very, very simple for you. These chips connect to the board using little, little balls of solder. It used to be that when you had a chip or a CPU that these things were so small and simple that you could just have legs shooting out the side of it and then all those little legs get soldered onto the board. And as time went on and devices got smaller and smaller and more complicated, you ran out of space to put these connections. So what they did is they decided, instead of just using the outside of the chip, we can actually use the entire chip and put these little balls on. So now we can use the entire chip to have connections that go to the board. And all of these are in the form of little solder balls that go underneath the chip. So these are solder balls that are underneath the chip. And a lot of people uh, have been going on and on with this myth, this silly myth, that the problem with graphics chips failing is that the balls underneath the chip are the cause of the problem. And I want to go into why people believe that to be true, why people continue to believe that it is true in spite of evidence that it is not true, and what the real solution is. 
people believe it to be true because when they replace the balls, the chip works again. So in order to actually remove uh, the balls from the chip and put new ones on, you have to lift the chip off the board. Soldering requires very, very high temperatures. So let's say I have this machine over here. I'm going to lift this chip at something like 217 Celsius, and I'm going to put it back on with leaded solder balls at something like 180 Celsius. Now that's going to apply a lot of heat to the chip. And I'm not actually fixing the chip by replacing the balls, but the thing is to replace these solder balls, I have to heat the chip. And the process of heating the chip is actually what's fixing it. I'm fixing this chip by heating it, not by replacing the solder balls. So the problem in this chip, the real true problem, is not the solder balls. The solder balls are fine, and I'm going to go on to tell you how you can see that for yourself. The problem is the actual chip. So here, you see this little silver part in the top of the chip? Let's see if the camera will eventually focus on me. Let's see if the camera will focus on my chip. Come on, autofocus. I saw you do it before. All right, so see this silver thing up here? That is connecting to the green thing over here through little bumps inside the chip. And then this green thing attaches to the board through solder balls. Now the problem is that the actual bumps inside of this chip are completely destroyed. They're sodomized. They're, they're beat to shit over long, long periods of time of being heated incredibly within systems with poor ventilation. And again, also, a lot of these chips, they frankly just suck. So when you have this combination those of those... So when you have those bumps get messed up, you can actually fix them through heating the chip. So when you heat this chip to 200 Celsius, you're actually moving around and messing with those little bumps inside the chip itself, and that fixes the chip. The problem is that the chip itself is dead. The chip itself is failing. The, the, the entire wafer, everything inside of here, everything how, how this is set up is just completely falling apart and going to ship. And you've just happened to move some of this around by heating it. It's kind of like using a piece of wood to hold up a broken wall, and then when the wall moves, a little bit, you just kick the piece of wood and it just so happens to move back into place and keep the wall from falling on you. But the problem is the next time that the wind blows, it's going to blow your wall back down again. You haven't actually fixed the problem. You haven't fixed and put a proper wall up with a, and you haven't done proper construction. You're just holding it up with a piece of wood. And the same is true when you heat up a dead chip. So the reason people believe that reballing works, the reason they believe the myth that the solder balls are the problem is because when they do this process and they do this reballing, it actually works again. The way to prove this myth wrong, the greatest way to prove this myth wrong is to actually measure the temperature while you're heating the chip and stop heating it at around 120 to 140 Celsius. Now, the solder balls that are used to connect this to a laptop motherboard nowadays are lead-free solder balls. Lead-free solder balls have different melting temperatures depending on the exact alloy used, but on average, lead-free solder balls melt at 217 Celsius. I'm telling you to heat the chip up to 120 Celsius. That's almost 100 Celsius less than what you need to actually melt the balls. Heat it up for 5 to 15 minutes. I would say to be safe, like somewhere around the 5 minute mark. Just heat it up, put something over here, you know, buy some cheap ass little temperature sensor on eBay with a little probe that goes over here. Put it on there and measure and, and just keep it at 120 Celsius for what I would say is five minutes of time. And what you're going to see a lot of the times is that the 120, 150 Celsius mark for five minutes, the chip itself is going to work. Now, if the solder balls were the problem, that would not have fixed the issue because the solder balls don't melt until 217. But the reason you fix the issue at 150 is because the issue is not with the solder balls, it's inside the chip. But nobody wants to believe that. And the thing is, when you reball this chip, you again, you have to use a machine like that at 217 Celsius to remove it. And then to put it back on with leaded balls, you need to use 180 Celsius, which is more than enough to heat up the inside of the chip to fix your problem. Now, uh, let me go into why people like to think that reballing is a repair for the issue. Again, as I said, they are going to heat the chip up and it's going to work again. They're going to reball it and it's going to work again because they heated up the inside of the chip. So now they believe it works. Let's go into why people like to think it works, even though it actually doesn't. Let's, people like to believe something if they have a reason to. If you have a reason to believe that something is true, you may believe it even if everything else uh, points otherwise. For example, I was recently in Las Vegas on vacation. We went to this restaurant called Dick's Last Resort. Now, in the front of Dick's Last Resort, two beautiful, I mean just model class women walked up to me and begged me to take a picture with them. Now, if I didn't have all my marbles, I may say to myself, these women must just like me. I, must just, I, I, I was dressed really great today. In reality, they wanted me to give them $50 for the picture. Now, since I had a brain in my head and I was using my analytical thinking, 
I thought to myself, I'm a technician in a cheesy polo shirt with a crappy haircut. What the fuck do these two women want with me? And I said, you know, nah, I'd rather not take a picture. And I continued moving on to my table. Again, had I believed this shit, I might have actually had been inclined to pay them for a picture, but I didn't pay them for a picture because I used my brain. As much as I may want it to be true that two beautiful model class women want to spend time with me, I think to myself, why did these two beautiful half-naked women walk up to me and just start talking to me out of nowhere. And the reason is because they wanted $50. You know, a lot of the times if you want something to be true, you will believe that you'll make it true. You'll believe it to be true even when it's not. And there are reasons as to why people want this to be true. The first is that for a lot of these devices, these chips are no longer available. So again, when somebody walks in with a 2006 or a 2007 MacBook Pro with an ATI graphics chip, a lot of the people, believe it or not, even though these machines are complete steaming piles of garbage, they actually want them fixed. They get attached to them. It's, if there's anything about Apple products is that it creates loyalty in the user. It creates loyalty to keep this thing running as long as humanly possible. People forget about the fact that it is a computer and that after a certain amount of time, it just becomes a useless piece of crap. At the very least, laptops do. Desktops you can continue using for a long time, but laptops, like, you really, they, they don't use standard parts, and when certain parts fail, you just got to throw it away. And it's hard to explain to the customer. It's hard to explain to these people, you need to throw this away. It's difficult. And also, above all else, it is so hard to not take their money when they want to give it to you. It is so hard when they're taking their wallet on going, I'm willing to pay to tell them there's nothing I can do. But the proper thing to do when somebody comes in and you cannot replace their chip with a new one and their chip has failed, the proper thing to do is to say, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. I'm sorry, your game console is dead. I'm sorry, your A1150 MacBook Pro is dead. But it's hard for people to do this. It's hard for people to say, I am not only am I not going to help you, I'm not going to help you and I'm not going to make money. And when they see that there's a solution that works, when they see there's a solution that works, this fixes the issue. I'm going to make you happy and I'm going to make money. Do you think that they're going to want to read the truth? Do you think they're going to want to read an article that talks about why it's the bumps in the chip and not the solder balls? Do you think they're going to want to listen to people like me who are telling them that, uh, that they're wrong? No, they have a little solution. They've created a little bubble for themselves. So they live in this other world. They live in this world that defies science where reballing dead graphics chips actually fixes shit. But the problem is that reballing a dead GPU doesn't fix anything. And again, a lot of I have this argument on a regular basis with people, and I'll be honest with you, we've we, we've done it, we've tried it. You know, again, a long time ago, it's not you know, it's not like I was born with all the knowledge in the world. And what I figured out very quickly in the hipster art artist video editing fiend capital of the world that is the New York is that you can't get away with re you can't get away with reball GPUs. No, no, that, that that shit does not work. And again, if you are heating up these chips to make them work again and you're giving them back to people who do nothing but Facebook, if you're giving them back to people who use their computer once a month, if you're giving it back to somebody who uses their computer in the morning to check the weather, you can get away with that. You can. But video editing capital of the world. I would say that New York City is one of the Mac capitals of the world. There are more people here using Macs for creative purposes than in almost every other area of the world combined. I mean, you just walk down the street and you see nothing but Apple stuff. There are a lot of studios here that use nothing but Apple. There are a lot of creative professionals that come to New York to make a living and all of these people use nothing but Apple. And if you are going to try to reball graphics chips, if you're going to try to do this shit and give it back to them, they are going to revolt against you. And again, if and a lot of the people who are saying, I reball and it works just fine, I looked them up. They have one review on Yelp for the five years they've been in business. Their business address is their mother's basement, and they're in the middle of, like, Kansas or Iowa. And no offense to Kansas or Iowa, but again... Do you have as many creative professionals in these regions that, that are as densely populated as New York? No. So you probably, and again, I'm not trying to sit on some high horse, you probably just don't have the experience that I do. Being in this area and doing what I do in this area gives me a level of experience that a lot of people who are even smarter than me, who know more than me, don't have dealing with these particular products because you probably don't have the volume of creative professionals coming to you with these problems. And... You probably also don't have to deal with the volume of these creative professionals who come back to you when you give them rebald garbage. Once these things die, once these graphics chips die, they belong 
in the garbage. And if you miss while you're throwing it in the garbage, that doesn't mean that you can reball it. That means you just throw it back in the garbage. Now, let me talk about where reballing is legitimate. Reballing is legitimate when the chip itself actually works, but you just need to reuse it. Let's say it's an SMC chip. So one great example, you can't get new SMC chips to Apple motherboards. You need to take them off of another one. When you take that chip off, the balls are going to be messed up. So you're going to have to reball it. it. And those are not chips with this type of design. So this chip has something called a flip chip design. Flip chip designs are more likely to have this issue with bumps and all this other crap that you can fix when you heat it up than other types types of BGA packages. Uh, you know, Intel CPUs, you can reball those. Uh, there are many times you can reball an Intel Southbridge and that will fix your problem. There are many times where the balls are actually the problem because the machine was physically damaged in a way and the balls themselves have actually cracked. So you press on the chip <coughs> and it starts working again, but you take your finger off the chip and it dies and you're touching the green part, not the top uh, silver part. and Again, there are times where reballing actually works, but 99% of the time, I mean 99% when I hear people talking about reballing, they are asking me to reball a dead GPU. They are telling me that they reball dead GPUs. And you need to realize the shit is dead. Now, one of the common things that people tell me is that I, well, I'm doing it because it's the only solution. I'm doing it because I don't want to turn away business and make people mad. Clearly, from your channel, you hate customers and you like making people mad and you hate people. And, you know, that's the common shit that I hear. That's the common excuse that I hear when I bring up why rebalding is bullshit. <clears throat> Let me tell you the truth about dealing with customers. Let me tell you an honest bit of truth that you need to hear if that's really what you believe. When a customer comes in with that A1150 MacBook that they edit video on, when they come in with that thing and it's dead and you explain to them honestly, why you cannot fix it, how there are no new chips, how the only way to fix it is an, a silly myth that is not going to last more than a month or two. They are going to hate their computer. They are going to hate that this happened to them. They're not going to be happy. They're going to hate Apple for wanting a 2000 bucks for a new machine. They're going to hate their boss for demanding that they get the work done when they don't have a working machine. They're going to hate their, all their clients that are bitching at them that they need to get this done faster, but they're not going to hate you. When you reball their machine and it works again and they hand you that 250 or that 350 bucks, they're going to like you. They're going to be happy that you got everything back working. But in a month, it's going to fail. And then you're going to fix it again. And they're going to not like you that much. And then a month later, it's going to fail again. And then you're going to fix it. And they're going to hate you. So if you tell them up front, I cannot fix this. Here's why. They're going to hate everybody else in the world. But that anger is going to be directed everywhere else. But when you decide to fix it because you are weak-willed and weak-minded and are looking for the quick money up front and are looking to make somebody happy up front without thinking about what's going to happen down the road, they are going to hate you. I am in business to keep people happy long term. I don't care if they hate me right now. I don't care if they hate me one day from now. What I want is for them to make the right decision for themselves, even if they really hate me as a result of doing it. I don't want to do something where they're going to love me right now, but two months from now, in the middle of a very important set, their shit just dies. I'd rather they hate me. I'd rather they hate me and say, fuck that computer guy, he didn't fix my shit. Fuck him, I'm giving him a one-star Yelp review. Fuck him, he's an asshole. I would rather all of that crap and, the, and, all, and they get something that works for them than for me to do what they ask me to do and then have that thing die on them one month into a set. Or even worse, I fix it and then they sell it to some other poor sucker that doesn't even know that it was repaired and now he has a dead rebought GPU out there that, just, that, that he uses for live music that dies in the middle of his set. That's bad. Every single choice that you give a customer should be some type of long-term solution to their problem. It shouldn't be some sort of short-term bullshit with a 30-day warranty.